Welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show, the first one, in fact, of 2021. So happy new year to all you GMBN techers out there. And thank you once again for tuning in to this weekly show. Now, coming up on this week's show, a little bit different to usual. The first one, a bit slow starting. We've only been at work for a day now here at GMBN Tech in 2021. And we're going to look at some stuff we're looking forward to in 2021. Also, we're going to be looking at some of the tech trends, things you're going to notice happening a lot more this year in mountain biking. And also, we've got some great regulars from you lovely lot. Okay, so let's get 2021 kicked well and truly off on GMBN Tech. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Brand new year. 2020 went by in a flash. It was the most bizarre year, I think, for all of us. Uh, certainly so in the bike industry where we missed out on all the great racing, all the great events around there. Don't get me wrong, there were some races, but they were definitely not what they would have been. Now, we missed out on a whole bunch of amazing tech shows and things to go to, so we are definitely going to be traveling a hell of a lot in 21, and I'm really, really excited about it. I feel like I've been let off the leads a bit here, so uh, it's going to be an amazing year. So hopefully there's some of these events I'm going to read out that you might be interested in going to yourselves. Now, I'm going to start with the biggest and probably the one I enjoy the most. That's Sea Otto, the US Sea Otto, which is in Monterey. Uh, it's at Laguna Seca Raceway in California, and it's just an incredible event. It's a big outdoor expo, so there's some pictures whizzing past on screen at the moment. Now, it's normally around April, and it's moved back to the 20, 20th to 23rd of May, so fingers crossed travel will open up and I hope that there's going to be no extended sort of developments from the pandemic. So fingers crossed massively that this goes ahead. Honestly, it's the best place to see all the latest bike stuff. The bike industry flood there in their masses, but it's also a great public event because there's loads of competitions. You know, there's uh, endurance racing, there's road racing, there's e-bike races, there's just everything going on. Of course, the classic slalom, the downhill. You can see your favorite pros racing. You can see the brand new kit on their bikes and you can get all touchy-feely. Well, hopefully we can get all touchy-feely if the restrictions allow with all of the latest tech. And we're gonna be bringing you everything from there. I'm going to go and find all of the best tech and show you exactly what there is. Uh, it's just some clips flying by from previous Seattle events. Of course, we didn't get to go in 2020, so we're going to hit it hard in 21. Uh, that's the first one on the list and the one I'm looking forward to um, probably the most as far as tech goes, but probably the most exciting event of the year especially for all of us here at GMBN. It's got to be our own festival, the Global Bike Festival. Uh, again, there's some shots that flying past on screen. It's going to be held at Solbach. The dates are the 17th to the 20th of June. And this is a cycling festival. This isn't just mountain biking, kind of like Seattle is open to all styles of riding. It's the same with our very own festival. So just think we're going to have people from EMBN there, people from GCN and GCN Tech, GMBN, GMBN Tech. We're all going to be there. The presenters are going to be there. You can come and ride with us. You can come and heckle us. Heckle Blake, uh, don't heckle me, be nice to me. I just want to ride my bike and have fun with you lot. Um, also, I'm going to be doing some clinics with Calvin Jones from Park Tool, uh, some live demonstrations and stuff, some Q&As, uh, some live ask shows. There's going to be pub quizzes, there's going to be parties in the evening, some on the top of the mountains, some down in the village. Yeah, I'm on the uh, the DJ bill, which I'm pretty happy about. I used to DJ quite a lot and uh, I haven't done for a few years now, so really excited about that. So the confirmed DJs from last year that have carried over include Rob the Bank, DJ Yoda, Crafty Cuts, the King of Breaks from Brighton, uh, DJ Yoda obviously just said him, and the legendary Norman J MBE. Uh, now rumour has it, Norman J has a very large collection of rally choppers, he's quite into his bike, so I really hope I get to spend some time with him. I uh, always used to go and see Norman J at the Good Time Stand at Notting Hill Carnival, I've uh, got so many fond memories of so many great tunes playing there. So there's going to be a proper music festival vibe to this, like to our global bike festival. Come ride with us in a day, learn about bikes, take part in competitions that are going on, road and off-road, pub quizzes, you name it, it is going off. So uh, get involved with your tickets, there's details on the bottom of the screen right there, and we'll see you there. And next up is another Sea Otter event. So yes, you can go along and try the bikes out, you can race, take part, see everything, but this time in Europe. So if you don't wanna make the massive trip over to the States for the big bad boy show, get yourselves to Girona in Spain. So this one is an amazing venue. 
The town is just absolutely stunning to walk around. And the first event that we went to is actually the second year been running and it was really, really good. So this time it's gonna be phenomenal. Uh, the dates for this one are the 24th to the 26th of September. So it's got plenty of time for the world to get ready for it. And I reckon that this one is gonna be a really special show. They also had a retro class here, which I absolutely loved looking through all of the bikes. Uh, so if that tickles you, uh, you might well like this as well. Okay, next up, Taipei beginning end of the year. Now this actually was something I was looking forward to most because I've never been to the Taipei show and I actually had the opportunity to go and make a video in a factory which we're still going to make with uh, restrictions allowing so I'm not going to tell you who it is but you'll find out and basically I'll get to see some of the industry like firsthand. I'm so excited about this. There's places out there that I'm gagging to go and see and I want to show you everything they have to show and of course the show itself, Taipei Bike Show. There's going to be some crazy stuff there. So uh, look out for that one. I think that is going to be an awesome show. All right, what else have we got? Eurobike. How can I forget Eurobike? The biggest European show. Uh, this one is colossal. Uh, every brand, even many brands you've never even heard of are exhibiting there. This year, it's at the end of the year, so 1st to the 4th of September. Again, plenty of time to get ourselves down to Friedrichshafen there. Uh, what an amazing show. If you've never been, it's a great one to tick off. It is flipping massive. It's held in Zeppelin hangars. Any idea how big a Zeppelin is? They are flipping massive. And the last event I want to mention isn't really a tech event as such, but it's something a bit closer to home for us. Um, it's an event called the Mulvans Classic. It's one of the very first, in fact, I think my first ever mountain bike race was at the Mulvans Classic in 1990. Um, and this one, unfortunately, has been cancelled the last two years. Once because of COVID and the previous time because of flooding. The most insane weather happened on the run up to it. Uh, but this year it's going to be going ahead, no problem. They've moved it. So it's now on the 26th to 29th of August. Got loads of classic things going on there. There's a retro show and shine. So you're going to get people entering bikes to be judged by a panel of judges. There's uh, DJing and music and bands playing. Again, I'm on the bill for that as well. So I'm really looking forward to playing uh, to certainly a lot of my friends in the bike industry, to be honest. Uh, they've got, um, I'm just looking at my screen here, the amount of things got XC, Slalom, Jewel Eliminated, a retro cross country race. There's just loads of cool stuff. Bit more of a family vibe on a smaller scale. It's very different uh, to our festival. Our festival is a big, massive one. This one is a home festival and I'm really excited about it because very much to myself, this is where I really started with my mountain biking sort of career and my love for the sport. So, and I think the organizers really know that as well. They really know how to capture exactly that feeling, all the magic that had, the excitement of the 90s, but with a modern twist. So uh, hopefully look forward to that. Um, you might have noticed as well, I'm wearing a muck-off personalized apron. This has got to be, uh, I've got to say sorry to my wife, this is probably one of my favorite presents for Christmas because my last one is absolutely covered in stains of grease. I've got a brand new one now. I keep getting told off for wearing it though. I should probably take it off because I'm supposed to be wearing my GMBN t-shirt. <laughs> Okay, so moving on with the show and let's take a look at some trends for 2021 uh, because there's loads of cool stuff going on in the bike world. Some of it is emerging patterns and actually I think some things are starting to finally settle down. Uh, the first of which is geometry. Now I think geometry in 2021 might finally start backing off a bit. Now for the last couple of years, I don't know about you, but I've grown sick and tired of everyone telling you they've launched the latest longer, lower, slacker bike. It's like, yeah, whatever. Crimea River, I don't need to hear that stuff anymore. Thankfully, most of the bike industry is on board with modern geometry bicycles. That is great for you, it's great for me, it's great for everyone, because bikes mostly are just brilliant now. In fact, bikes today is really, really hard to buy a bad bike. It's never been a better time to buy a good mountain bike. Honestly, you get a hell of a lot for your money. There's so many options whether you want to go for a real high-end boutique brand or if you want to go for a direct great value brand, there literally is something for everyone. And there's no corner cutting anymore. It's really, really decent. But I'm really pleased about the geometry thing because I've been banging on about long geometry for probably since 2014. But uh, standards is another bugbear. And I think we're not going to see that many new standards. So in previous years, you know, we've seen 10, 11, now 12 speed come out. We've seen Shimano bring out the micro spline, which largely is going to move uh, spline over to the side as everyone goes for the 12 speed on there. But I'd actually like to see that wheeled out across 
all of the spline and stuff. They'd obviously have to continue making the old spline system for older part model numbers and stuff, but the micro spline is brilliant. It works really, really well. Great contact on there, and you don't get the cassettes cutting into the free hub. So that is a standard that I really, really want to see happen in 2021, but um, it's not actually happening. I just want it to. But what we're going to see is, um, Unfortunately, we're going to see 157, the Super Boost, creeping out a bit further because uh, arguably you can eke out a bit more stiffness at the back end of a bike. To be honest, I'd rather just see a stronger wheel. Um, maybe some more spokes. We've been lacking in the amount of spokes we usually use. It always used to be 32 or 36 spokes. Now we're down to like 24 and 28. It seems to be a bit more commonplace. Uh, put more spokes in if you want a real stiff wheel. That's how you get it. So I'd actually like, even though it does make sense from some points of view, I don't want my rear mech to be even further out than it already is, you know, nearer to rocks. Uh, you know, I know you can get the mechs, you know, with the Shadow Plus technology sitting under dropout, but still, you want it as inboard as you can possibly get. So I don't think going super Super wide is necessarily the way, but you're going to see it on more bikes. Now, an interesting standard that I think might actually start coming in a bit more is the 1.8 steerer tubes. Now, we're not talking like the old 1.5 that was all the way up. We're talking a 1.8 tapered, so it tapers instead of from 1.5 into inch and an eighth, it's going to be tapering from 1.8 inches up to inch and eighth. Now, I've already seen this on Suntour forks, and RockShox offer it on the Zeb, mostly aiming it at e-bikes, but my money is on other brands and none e-bike brands adopting this on some of their big travel bikes. Think of all those sort of park bikes like that Norco Shore is crying out for it because you want to make the bike as strong and as stiff as possible so you can literally thrash the pants off the things. So I think that is a standard that will start creeping in but really for forks of 180 mil um, and maybe a bit more than that because that's where you really do need that front end stiffness. Um, the SRAM Universal Derailleur Hanger, I mean, that should be law, as far as I'm concerned. I think it's a brilliant invention, because we all know there's God knows how many annoying mech hanger standards out there. They're not even standards, annoying mech hangers. Uh, you, can, you can go to a website that literally just has all the mech hangers. It's ridiculous. And then SRAM did open source with UDH and anyone can spec it. it didn't cost them any money. So manufacturers should be specking that. It makes life easier for you, it makes life easier for me when I break a derailleur. Uh, when I'm in Morsian on holiday, so you just go to any of the bike shops and just pick one up. That's what it should all be about. 35 mil bars. Now this is an interesting one. So this has been creeping in for a while, but a lot of manufacturers still offer 31.8 or 35. Now it is possible to get a 35 mil bar that's a bit stiffer than 31.8, but you can also get some 31.8 bars that are really stiff. So really there is not many reasons. There's not much difference in strength. There's not much difference in weight. There's barely any difference between them. However, the major thing I see is the 35 mil just looks a bit better. Now, not necessarily because it's fatter. I'm not, you know, I don't necessarily want something that's that big on a bike, but I like to run high rise bars and they don't always look very nice. So a high rise, say a 38 mil rise bar in a 31.8 looks like a massive rise bar. But if you get a 38 mil rise bar in a 35 diameter bar, it looks far less. It looks much neater and the shape of these sort of bars, the taper on them uh, up to the 35 mil just really flatters the front end of a lot of hydroformed aluminium bikes and carbon bikes. It just kind of fits in really well. So I do see gradually that 31.8 is going to start phasing out even more. I mean, we used to be on 22.2 at one point, so pretty crazy. And then it was 25.4 and then of course 31.8. So uh, bit by bit, they're moving across. So I suspect you're gonna see much more 35 mil stuff. That's just some of the standards creeping around. But uh, the next one I wanna talk about is something a bit more interesting, actually. Um, I've kind of dug my heels in this, but um, gravel bikes, yeah. Yeah, they're not going anywhere, okay? So let's put this to bed, okay? So gravel bikes sit somewhere between us on GMBN and them over on GCN. Firmly in the middle, because you can arguably ride them on some mountain biking trails, but you can also ride some roads on them. So uh, best of both worlds, right? Well, I don't believe so, but I want to be proven wrong. I just don't get why you wouldn't just get a cross-country bike, especially with the new breed of what we're seeing, flat bar gravel bikes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that pretty much is an old style mountain bike. There's not much different on it. And in fact, a lot of the ones that you're starting to see, so the uh, Marin uh, DSX, pretty nice, the DSX2 in particular, I think it's good with the Tamil tires. Uh, Specialized Diverge Evo, again, a lovely looking bike. Uh, Norco Surge XR, Commissar FCB, that's this one on screen now. Looks great, doesn't it? But it's a bit of a weird bike. And the white Portobello V2, named after Portobello Road, perhaps, bit of an urban thing going on there. Um, 
But the thing is, I just, honestly, I don't get it. You can get, my cross country bike just got, without pedals on it, without a water bottle on it, weighs 23 pounds. And it rides really well off-road. And it's got suspension front and rear that you can completely lock out if you see fit. I'm gonna use it for bike packing this year at some point. I might even be persuaded to do a race if I can get my ass in gear and get fit again. Uh, just need some more saddle time to do that. But my point is, I wanna go bike packing and stuff on a mountain bike, so I don't wanna be hampered back. And let's not forget, the position on mountain bikes is the most comfy one you can get, which is why you're starting to see the drop bar gravel bikes migrating into flat bar gravel bikes. And they're even talking about how the geometry, you know, increasing the trail to make them a bit more stable at speed when you're riding them off-road. Get a mountain bike, surely. Um, okay, so food for thought there, but looking at the way things are going, sensibly with gravel bikes, I think we are definitely gonna do some stuff with them. And I think I really need to just get one basically and cut through all of it. And let's just see, all right, what is a gravel bike? What are they actually good for? And what are they terrible for? And I'm gonna put a mountain bike directly head to head with one, just so we can see just where, where that line actually is. And I think you'll find the mountain bike will come up trumps in more areas than the gravel bike. But uh, hey, I'm willing to be wrong on this, but uh, I definitely think that is something we're gonna see happening this year. I think the next thing we're gonna start seeing more of is tire inserts, and I even suspect you're gonna start seeing them spec on some bikes, and that's gonna gradually filter down, just like you can have tubeless spec, but they won't necessarily be set up. I wouldn't be so surprised if you don't start seeing some bikes coming with them at some point. Now, the whole tubeless insert thing, you know, we know about this, we know about um, moose and stuff that you get in the Moto Trials world, we've always seen that technology, and when you start filtering into mountain bikes, the initial ones that took off were things like Schwalbe Procore, which essentially was a tire with an inner tube that you run at an insanely hard pressure inside your tire. And the system worked brilliantly. However, it cost an absolute fortune and it could be really, really tricky to set up and not impossible to remove a tire sometimes. So uh, not the ideal setup, but it paved the way for a whole bunch of different options, right? including Cushcore, Nootproof Ard, uh, Rimpact. There's loads out there. And you're definitely gonna start seeing them across the board on more bikes, gravel bikes, cross country bikes, as well as the obvious trail and enduro style bikes. Now really, what is the advantage when you can just get tires these days with sidewall protection? Well, you can achieve a very different feel. And in particular, on the lightweight end, I actually see more of a benefit from running them than the out and out predictable ones running them on enduro bike to guarantee you to get to the end of the stage. On a cross country bike, for example, you can get nice thin tires with some support on them that allow you to run lower pressures, but you can also get extremely lightweight tires that one of the benefits is the weight for rolling resistance, but the other benefit is the feel of the tire. You cannot beat the feel of a very supple tire, the way it can conform uh, and achieve grip. It feels very different to the same tire in a different casing. Honestly, it's day and night, which is why I've actually started running the airliner system from Vittoria. So it's basically their take on an insert. Running those, well, just for a start on the rear, I did try it in the front, but I didn't find I needed to lower my pressures quite as much, but it made more of a difference on the rear of the bike. And I'm a convert now. It doesn't add much weight and it really does change the way the bike feels. So I do think you're gonna start seeing more technology and more features coming from things like tire inserts in 2021. It will also be really interesting with tire inserts to see what pros are using them. Uh, definitely suspect it's gonna be another added thing on a pro bike check. Uh, are you running inserts? Are you running in front and rear? And what pressures are you running with them? Uh, just think what's happening in cross country racing, rims are getting bigger, tires are getting bigger. We're gonna get onto cross country tech in a little while. But uh, airliners and new provards and cush cores and all those sorts of things, they are a great benefit. And definitely, if you've not considered them, check them out. Trail bikes. For 2021, the trail bike is gonna be king. I've said this before, that shorter travel bikes can offer you more. And now that geometry has caught up, enabling all of those bikes with less travel to handle much more aggressive terrain should you want to ride it, there's almost no reason to not look at them as your major bike. If you can only have one, these are the types of bike that you want. Something with around 140 mil travel if you've got 27 half inch wheels or 130 mil travel with 29 inch wheels. You can get them pretty rowdy geometry, pretty slack, uh, slack at the front, steep in the middle there or you can get a bit more traditional, something a bit whippier uh, to give you the kind of ride that you might be looking for. Now, there's a few options buzzing up on screen of great examples. So Nuke Proof Reactor, I'm obviously gonna say that because I ride one. I love that bike, I genuinely love it. But the thing that's a bit different about the Reactor from many of the other ones I'm gonna list off here is the Reactor is actually a very heavy duty trail bike. Yep, you can build up to be reasonably lightweight, but also you could overspec it. You could put a bigger travel fork on it, you could put a coil shock on it, 
and you could basically treat it like an enduro bike. So it actually does span across genres there. It makes it a really versatile weapon. So Privateer 141. What Privateer are doing is amazing. And if you haven't heard of them, then definitely check them out. All the links to these brands, by the way, are gonna be in the description underneath this video. So you can just click through there. So the Privateer 141, steep seat angle, slack head angle, nice long geometry, incredible build package, great value. Yeah, okay, it might not look, look quite as nice as that high-end Santa Cruz that you've always fancied, but look at the spec and look at the geometry. These things are brilliant. So just amazing to see that these bikes are so good. And it's just a great example of a really good trail bike. Very capable, and if you do really prefer a bit more travel, they do do an enduro version with 160 mil travel. But um, the 141, that is the one to get. Specialized stump jumper. I already hate to mention Specialized because I really like Specialized and they just make so many damn good bikes and the Stump Jumper, well, clearly it's one of them. All Bayer with the Occam, another great bike, exceptionally lightweight, actually, deceptively so. If you fancy a trail bike and you want to keep it on the slim side, definitely have a look at those. You'd be very surprised at the overall package. Uh, the YT ESO, or the ISO, that thing, I tell you, if I was going to buy any of those tomorrow, that's probably what I would have. Um, it, look at it, look at the thing, look at the top tube. That line reminds me of Mondraker a little bit. You know, it's knife edge, like a blade going into a seat stage. That is how you build a good looking bike. I tell you, that thing, I reckon it goes like stink. Love to ride one of those. Uh, what else? Cannondale Habit, of course. Cannondale Habit is getting everywhere. And these are the sorts of bikes. Light enough to ride all day long, light enough to ride and race them in cross country if you really wanted to as well, put some lightweight tires and wheels on them, or burly them up and go and have fun in the bike park. The trail bike is king, and it's gonna be the king for 2021, I'm sure of it. Something else we're definitely starting to see a bit of a trend moving in is a bit of a return for 275 bikes, as in 27.5 bikes. Uh, in particular, longer travel, more fun bikes. We've seen that Norco Shore, which is firmly aimed at doing, you know, lap after lap in hardcore bike parks like Whistler or maybe out in Morzine or somewhere. If you're gonna to plan to do a season, this is a bike you definitely wanna consider. It's got a high pivot. It's gonna be insanely plush. It is built like a tank. It's gonna ride really, really well. And you can basically treat it dirty as you like. And it's gonna keep coming back for more. That's what you want from one of these sort of bikes. And the Pivot Max 6, Perhaps a slightly more refined offering there, but slack is long, runs a coil shock, treat it mean. Brilliant looking bike. And then of course, Santa Cruz with their latest version of the Nomad. Again, same thing, small wheels, big on fun. So just because 29s are everywhere, and yeah, all right, I've got a soft spot for 29, don't overlook these bikes. So for big travel, but you want them to feel a bit lighter, sometimes the 27 and a half is better. Now let's not forget, the intention of these particular bikes, let's use the Norco as a great example. The intention of that in a bike park, think of the weight of the wheels that you might need for a 29 version of the same bike. You'll need downhill tires definitely to cope with what that bike could do. And you'll need bigger, heavier wheels. That means the whole thing might not feel as lively. Yeah, it'll go like a train through braking bumps and through the rough stuff. But if you're a sort of rider who just wants to hit Dirt Merchant and D1 and trails like that and just get loads of air and hang the bike out, then you don't always want that feeling of the 29 inch wheels. You want the bike to feel a bit lighter. If that's you, then you want to be looking at 27 and a half bikes. And well, they're not going away. And there's a bit of an influx of them coming back. So keep an eye out for new ones in 2021. More XC tech. There's going to be loads of development in XC. It's pretty much the only part of mountain biking that we've not seen radical changes but there have been some incremental changes being wheeled out that you're starting to see. Now, for example, I've got pretty wide rims on my cross country bike, the E13 XCX 28 mil. Now, some people look at them and think, flipping it, they are massive for an XC rim, but don't forget DT are making 30 mil rims and there's other brands out there pushing the 30 mil thing. We've seen Nino Scherzer race 30 mil to great success with larger volume tires. It's coming, trust me. All of the tire brands are all gonna be offering slightly bigger, more bulbous tires for cross country to lower that pressure and basically increase how fast you can roll on a multitude of terrain. Of course, you're gonna have the bigger support you're gonna get with a wider tire and a wider rim combination. They're gonna be stronger, stiffer wheels, so you're gonna be able to make them lighter in other areas because the rim is gonna give it strength and rigidity. Seriously, there's gonna be a lot of interesting tech coming on. We're also gonna see more in the way of integrated dropper posts. Now, one of the coolest things I've seen is the dropper post that is on the BMC, uh, the four cross, four stroke even. Keep calling it a four cross there, so I'm just looking at my screen here. Uh, this is the dropper post. So it, it looks like it's just a regular seat post. It's integrated into the frame. 
brilliant piece of design. I think this will definitely translate to a lot of cross-country riders. They're looking for a lightweight solution. Uh, the particular one you see here, uh, the cool thing about this is you can actually charge it up and it'll go up and down by itself. Or you don't have to sit down to push it down. That is seriously cool tech. And yes, we do need this to come from another manufacturer. So get on it, RockShox. Get on it, Crank Brothers. Like, everyone needs to get on the case with integrated and self-dropping dropper posts because it is brilliant tech for cross-country. But also, super lightweight droppers as well. Like this one from DT is ridiculous. Like I never realized how light it was. So um, I've actually swapped out the post for Crank Brothers, that's what we run. But this is one that came with the Canyon bike. Um, it, I mean, it's actually got weight limit that I'm pretty much on it, so not for me. But if you're a super lightweight Whippet, check these things out from DT, uh, the D2321. It is bonkers as far as drop post goes. They get like that because it's carbon lower and it's basically an inverted design. What a cool piece of kit. Okay. Uh, bigger tyres, yeah, we said that because of the fact that you need that grip, you need that support. But like I said, tech in cross country is definitely coming on in, well, definitely coming on this year and next year. And I think you're also going to start to see bikes getting that bit longer. We've already seen Mondraker do it with that F podium that's definitely a longer bike, but it's not unreasonable. It's not as long as trail bikes, not as long as uh, enduro race bikes and things like that. It doesn't need to be. But bit of length will definitely gain a bit more stability and a better handling in cross-country racing without ruining the agile feel. Well there you go, there's a bunch of things that we're definitely going to see moving on as far as trends go in mountain biking. If you spotted anything that I've not mentioned, I'd love to know. Uh, let us know in those comments and we'll pick it up. Okay, next up is top mods. This is all about the mods that you do to your bike uh, and basically make it better than it was to start with. It could be anything, literally changing a front tire or it could be putting a brand new transmission on and giving it a fresh coat of decals or whatever it is. Now get involved, there's a link right there to our uploader. Let's kick 2021 off in a real big way. Get your bikes looking trick and send us the pictures. And I've got a real trick one here to show you first. So I'm just opening this up on my screen. You could probably see it already. It's a Yeti owned by uh, a chap called Nick. It's a Yeti SB130 Turk custom build uh, from North Carolina. So this is my Yeti dream build. Tried to source as much of the build as possible um, locally. Luckily, I live near Cane Creek and I-9, Industry 9. I've got a Cane Creek Helm Air Fork, core shock with a progressive spring. Oh yeah, I see what you've done there. Uh, the cool thing about the progressive springs is they're white as well. Um, well, I think it's cool anyway, but I'm shallow with things like that. <laughs> it looks really good. And everyone knows it's progressive spring as well. Uh, Tie-dye E-wing cranks. Oh my God, like that is probably my favorite set of, well, yeah, favorite set of cranks of all time. Have you seen these things? The way to join on BB axle. Oh my God, what a work of art. Unbelievable, it's almost a shame that's hidden away to be honest. Uh, Shimano four piston brakes, sh SRAM access drivetrain and drop post, Industry 9 Enduro 310C system wheels with hydro hubs. Finish up with one up carbon bars, uh, PNW grips, and a custom decal carbon wasp bolt on mudguard. I'll tell you what, mate, you must have saved some serious cash for this bike because that, you've just literally, it, there, there isn't anything you can improve on it. Absolutely banging that bike is. Uh, you didn't mention what brand you've gone for with your Retubus valve. It looks like you could have gone muck off and it's purple one on the back. Like in the purple editions. You got, obviously I like purple, don't I? But a uh, nice purple chain guide from one-up components, Crane Brothers stamp pedals as well. Good to see a set of uh, Victoria Mazas out in the wild as well. I love those tires. Decent. Mazza front and rear. I'll tell you what, that, that bike, look at the way it sits. I'd be tempted to... Um, lower the stem a bit and put a high rise bar on myself, but that is a personal preference, so uh, don't listen to me on that front. But beautiful bike, Nick, absolutely stunning. If you're gonna do a dream build, you may as well make it a dream bike, eh? That is absolutely gorgeous. Very envious of that, to be honest. Something about Yeti in there. Okay, next up is Gareth with his Commissal Combi Disc Hardtail uh, in Staffordshire. After getting back into mountain biking after break, I figured I'd stand a better chance of getting a new one past the misses if I proved my dedication through the winter on my old one. Yeah, cunning plan, I like it, going for the long game there. Uh, so I dusted off the old commie, uh, common style that is, and got out on it. So much has changed since I bought this bike, and we're worlds away from my first real mountain bike, a 1995 Marin Mewitz. Uh, so I figured I'd show her some TLC and some upgrades. Could do a bit more reach, I'll put a longer stem on there really. The second hand revelation for the uh, RockShox Revelation Force have transformed it and also from the Dart 2s that were on there as well. Brilliant. It's good to see an old bike brought back to life. 
Yeah, Panarasa smoke and dark tires. Nice in the tan walls there. Yeah, looking cool. Real cool. Good tires actually, surprisingly, aren't they? Bit kind of like BMW technology in their rear wheel drive, front wheel steering. State in the office, isn't it? But uh, they do work really well. Mate, it looks great. It cleans up a treat as well. But I think you've almost shot yourself in the foot there. He's done such a good job of it. Do you really need another bike? Sorry about that. Okay, next one is from Edward in Swindon. Photo is taken at Rawlton Pump Track. Not sure if this should be in top mods or rewind. I'll let you decide. During lockdown, I uh, lockdown 2.0, I bought an old 2002 orange missile frame. Wow, yeah, so that reminds me of Steve Gill and the uh, orange animal team there. Rad looking bike. Yeah, look at that, look at that box section tubing on the back end there. And that big, just trademark orange front end with those massive welds. I mean, it's funny, they look so overbuilt, but actually really quite lightweight. Bike looks rad. The original Pike Fork, the U-turns, really pleased to see that. I can't see if you've got the air or the coil ones. I've, I've had one of each over the years. That fork was phenomenal. So far ahead of its time. You could adjust the travel by turning a dial, I think from like 120 to 150 or something like that. Uh, but phenomenal being able to have that fork and literally screw it up and down. They work so well, so active. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Uh, so you've got a Pike Forks, Hope Hubs on Mavic 521 rims, classy. Uh, 1x10 setup using a Shimano Z rear mech, uh, needed the clutch. SLX brakes, shifter, crank arms, and a Hope 36 tooth narrow eye chainring. The only new parts are chain set grips, disc rotors. Uh, gone for a 203 front and a 180 rear. Flipping it, that's a big old rotor for a little hardtail buck like that. But uh, hey, must be fun. No pictures of build, sadly, as I just started fitting things as they arrived in the post. We all know what that's like. We're too desperate to get it on a bike and you forget about it. And I actually meant to show the build of my bike recently, but um, same thing. I built it up as quick as I could so I could go and ride the thing. Hey, we're all guilty of that. Hey, it looks great, doesn't it? Really nice looking bike out. I'll tell you what would look really cool on there if you wanted to have a bit of an old school look to it. It's uh, one of those sort of enclosed style chain guides. I know you've got a chain guide on there, but I mean like an MRP style one. You know the old orange rollers? Oh, I had a bad boy in that. It's uh, awesome stuff, great to see what you're all tinkering with and what you're building, but we want more. We want to see all of your bikes and we want to see some video entries. Tell us who you are and tell us why your bike is the best and what you've done to it. Love to see that stuff. See you next week. Okay, now it's time for a trip down memory lane. It's Rewind, which, yeah, is my favourite part of the show because I get to talk about all the old retro stuff. Uh, but thankfully, you've all been sending in some wicked stuff, so keep them coming. I've got to say that. There's a link right there. Whatever it is you've got that's pretty old, send it in. Come on, get involved. First up, another orange, actually. So this is an orange Aero. So this is rad. So this is from Adam in West Sussex. I had an Aero as my second proper mountain bike many, many, many years ago. Ended up selling it as I didn't have room for multiple bikes. Now also, I've always wanted another one and, uh, and I found this one on eBay. So I started chatting to the owner, found he's much like me, he's built it off the back of a student loan. Um, so basically sent the bike back to Orange, got it rebuilt and they actually sort of took some of the rough areas of paint off it and then repainted it in an epic shade of purple. Wow, so it was like a, almost like a navy shade to start with and you've gone for this purple which just looks amazing isn't it that kind of reminds me of the purple like the old pace bikes used to come in and then you've gone for the tan wall tires so it's kind of funny you've made it look more retro but somehow more modern at the same time now uh, rebuilt the hope dh4 brakes nice I love, I love seeing the fact that you've actually done all this stuff yourself here found some 26 inch skin wall tires from spain yeah nobby nicks mate it looks rad with a marzocchi fork on the front what well, looks like an Azonic stem or uh, a version of a stem that's very like an Azonic. Hope Caliper, you can't beat that for that era bike. They just look brilliant. I love the fact you rebuilt that as well. Very cool. Uh, it might be an, an Amoeba stem actually. That was a brand you'd get if you couldn't afford the Azonic one. I don't know, because I had a couple. Couldn't afford the Azonic ones back then. It cost a fortune. But um, 26 ain't dead. Hey, I like that change state guard. Where'd you get that from? Uh, let us know in the comments if you're watching this. That's really cool. We need one of those saying uh, 27 and a half ain't dead now though, don't we? Unfortunately. Purple pedals from DMR. So you've got the uh, the nylon pedals there. Not the pro ones, mind, but still very good pedals. There's a knobby next. There's a caliper stripped open again. Chris King headset. Oh, and a trademark orange badge on the head tube there. I think that's one of the coolest head tube badges actually. In fact, there's an idea. What bike 
and it's got the coolest head tube badge on it. I'd love to know what you think because I've got a bike of a head tube badge I'm pretty sure can't be beaten, uh, but definitely let us know what the coolest ones are and we'll pick it up as a, as a topic. We'll dig out some real cool looking bikes. But uh, yeah, that's a rad one. It's definitely a contender, the orange one, that's for sure. Nice to see the blanking bolts there on the uh, cantilever bosses out back. So that paint finish is incredible, isn't it? Really, really good. I bet it's thick paint as well, knowing those guys. Yeah, there's that Marzocchi bomber. Rad. Painted that up as well. <laughs> so good. Love it. Stripped it down. There's a core springs. Bomber 2001 decal kit. Seriously, like, great job. Okay, next one. Oh my God, we've got San Andreas in the house. So uh, from Adam in Newcastle upon time, I still own this bike, uh, ready for rebuild. Built it myself back in the day. I'll try and remember what was on it. Originally I had the Z1s until I changed for the Fox Vanilla. Race face post and stem, Mavic D521s on Hope Bulb Hubs. Yeah, I had um, I had Biggins and my friend got the bulbs, which I think came out just after them, uh, which were much lighter and actually looked a lot cooler. The Biggins look kind of a bit overkill. But uh, hey, both very cool hubs. Hope C2, so they did O2 and C2s. I actually had, I think I had O2s actually. I was gonna say I had C2s. C2s ones had the dials on the top, didn't they? So you changed the um, the pad contacts. Yeah, Pro Taper bars from Answer, DMR saddle, various chain sets over the years. The bike's so small compared to my current 29. I bet, but it looks rude still, doesn't it? Such a cool frame layout. Now, it, I don't know, maybe it is just that it's old or, or you've put a longer shock in it. it. Looks like the bottom bracket's a bit high in it, but um, hey, it might just be the jump tube from bikes back then. Nice to see the X-Lite decal on the effective top tube or the seat mask there. Um, most of you will know X-Lite is Muckoff these days. Muckoff was a product made by X-Lite and it was so popular, they basically made it into the major brand. Uh, that in itself is a very cool story. I'd love to delve into that a bit more for you at some point. Yeah, and there's a frame on the wall. So it's crazy to think that the first incarnation of the San Andreas frame was around, I think in like 92 or something. So it's crazy old and it had inverted fork, the mountain cycle suspender, and it had their own pro stop disc brakes, which had floating disc rotors that you see in the mo motorcycle world. And they were hydraulic calipers and cable actuators. So you could use your regular brake levers, like, I don't know, Shimano LX or something, with, a, with an inner cable actuating them. And that, you know, they did a full suspension bike with hydraulic disc brakes and floating rotors when everyone else hadn't even got as far as front suspension forks. Insane, absolutely insane. Rob Reisinger, I think, was the designer behind that brand. Uh, amazing stuff, truly amazing. In fact, I know a few people have got these. I'm going to do a, a bike check on one because it's such an interesting bike with such amazing tech. Uh, yeah, so more on that soon. Okay, so pretty much near the end of the show. Bit of an odd one uh, this week, I'm sure, but hey, straight back after Christmas and New Year. So you want to get bedded in nicely. Next week's going to be straight back in with all the latest news, all the latest tech that we've been saving up for a, a big bumper show. But uh, hopefully you enjoyed this show. Let us know what you think in the comments underneath as always. And please do continue to send in your rewinds, your top mods and your bike cave entries. Now I really want to start seeing some video clips from you all as well as just the photos. It's nice to know who you all are. Um, get involved, get your iPhone out, do a bit of selfie filming and send it in to the, uh, the addresses that are on screen there. And until next time, see you later. Ta-ra.